Coming up, fighting math of phobia, an award-winning rocket scientist is going to be and here. And we are here so with a rocket scientist. Like Hailed as the modern-day hidden figure by People magazine. Olympia. Since leaving the world of rocket science, she's applied her mathematical skills to banking and education yes. alike. Yes. The 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 Congratulations. You're here for a reason. By the process of you traveling here, you're going to change your life. I am Olympia LaPointe an award-winning rocket scientist who has helped launch over 28 NASA space shuttle missions. Now, you have more than likely seen me on a variety of different shows, from TED Talks to CBS to NBC News. You've seen my articles on the Huffington Post. You've seen my books on PBS. And today, I am here to share with you tips that's going to unleash your own brain power. Now, I'm not a classically trained neuroscientist. I do not have a degree in neuroscience or, or psychology, but rather I am a scientist who applies physics and mathematics to how the brain reshapes. What you will learn will be mind-blowing, literally. You see, you are here to learn about the key part of your life that will control and unleash the power of your life, and it's through your brain power. This is everything I needed, everything. Based on what she referenced in the book, it's exactly what I need at this moment in my life. She's absolutely amazing. And just by knowing her and all that she's been through, I really felt like what she was gonna teach today would be a gift, as it, it was a gift. It was a gift for everybody. So it was just an amazing talk. She's an eloquent speaker. Um, I just, I, I'm so excited. I just feel like it's like a life-changing experience. It's all very knowledgeable, amazing stuff. Combining both sides of your brain and then intervie interweaving faith with that was super inspiring. I'm impressed with Olympia, I'm really proud of her. Every single one of us has it. And it is so powerful. It is so magnificent. What you will learn in this next moment is groundbreaking science that is taken from rocket science and it's applied to what you and I both have the power of our brain. Welcome to Answers Unleashed. I am Olympia LaPointe, and it's wonderful to be here with you today. Now, you more than likely have seen me on so many different shows. You, you know me as a rocket scientist. You know me as someone who has launched rockets, the space shuttle specifically. You've seen specifically lots of different media about what I used to do. I was a rocket scientist for the space shuttle main engine program, a part of the NASA space shuttle program. In all, I helped launch 28 missions into space. I use mathematics and science to calculate the probability of catastrophic explosion within flight. That was my desk in the mission control room. We supported the mission control, and my job specifically was in that seat right there. You see that little R, that little cup right there to the left? That was my seat. It's actually where I sat for 12 hours at a time in a dark room looking at mathematics across the screen, and it was our job to verify we, we could catch anything before it would cause an explosion. I helped launch great machinery. This is a picture of Endeavor. It is at the California Science Center. And this picture actually uh, is courtesy of California State University Northridge, who brought me in there and did great photos so we could inspire people to go into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And you've seen me all around, and I'm thankful that you're here because you know what I do, and you know what you will learn. And it's this. The same math used to launch rockets it's a distant planet, it's the same math applied to unleash your brain's power. And first, you must know what your brain does. Today, I'm going to share with you 
something in which I have really, really come to appreciate, and it's the TRIA brain. It is what I call the mind and the brain together. Um, may I share something with you? Would it be okay if I share something um, really personal with you? Is that okay if I do that? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm real, and I've learned to become real. I've learned not to uh, be this cookie-cutter, perfect-appearing person because that's not who I am. I had to go through so many different things to get to where I am, and it has not been easy. And some of you have gone through things in your life that has been very difficult for you too. All of us have go through things in which are so difficult to comprehend. I came across this tree brain theory of relativity uh, by my life story. And it's, I'll just warn you right now, it's kind of graphic. It's not Disneyland. Rather, it's something that is very uh, deep. Uh, I was raised by a single mother. She raised four of us by ourselves in the middle of poverty. And uh, our life was very difficult. We would sometimes eat ice to try and pretend ourselves, just to pretend that we were actually eating food. And uh, I remember being six years old, and I went to this a uh, field trip to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it was so amazing because I saw jet engines, and I told myself I wanted to be just like those men that I saw that were launching rockets. But I had no clue about the challenges I would face or the emotional difficulty I would have to endure while trying to reach that goal. Uh, when I was eight years old, one of the most horrific things happened. Uh, there was a man, a friend of the family, which I trusted, and in the middle of the night, he raped me. Now, that's a horrible thing to say. It's even more horrible to remember. So much so that my brain erased it because I couldn't handle it until 30 years later. But after those 30 years, my brain could actually connect and to be able to speak up for the truth. <laughs> then there was another thing that happened, and some of you know this through my TED talk. I was in a fifth grade classroom sitting next to a gang member who had already been recruited into a gang at the age of 10. And he and I got into an argument, because I had a smart mouth, always had. And we got into an argument, and he had this ring on his finger that he filed down, and when he stalked me, he stabbed me, and I almost lost my left eye. It took me 20 years to be able to see the world clearly without emotion attached, but being able to see it as fact. And then, uh, during all these emotional challenges, my brain was literally in chaos. And it was very difficult for me, and I started failing algebra, geometry, calculus, and chemistry. And it was because my brain was not using and conducting its power the way it was designed. And it was a miracle, because uh, in the 11th grade, there was a man, that uh, a tutor, a uh, teacher specifically, who said that he was going to help all the students who would, were willing to show up during the winter break. And I showed up, and I was the only one to show up, and through learning with him, I realized I was smart. And I didn't recognize that when I finally started catching on to the mathematics and learning it, I was then connecting my brain. That helped me later to graduate from Cal State Northridge here as a mathematics major at the top of the class and apply those skills as a rocket scientist. And then the breakthrough happened. I was around these brilliant minds. I got a chance to see how powerful, different ways of thought can be. You see, we don't all think alike. We're not supposed to. We have a different way that we are supposed to think based on our own unique DNA that is unique to us. You can never compare yourself to anyone else, just like I couldn't compare myself to any one of the other scientists who were also geniuses. My job was to understand how they thought so I could express the science in a way that they could receive it. 
So I got a chance to overcome my own emotional challenges through science. But it wasn't completely tackling all parts of my brain, the logical part, perhaps. And then something uh, uh, just horrific happens. I was working as a rocket scientist in the year 2004. My mother was a pedestrian, and she was in a car accident. And she had to, she was a pedestrian in a car accident. And she had to go to the hospital. She almost died. And she went through brain surgery. And uh, the surgeon saw that she had two broken vertebrae during the surgery. They didn't know if she was going to survive, and she did. And the mir literally, a miracle was the next day, they looked at her spine, and there were no signs of broken vertebrae at all anymore, overnight. And so here I was, a scientist, but I couldn't ignore what just happened. It was something powerful, which I realized was the last part of this trier brain, which I'm about to tell you what this is. Then last year, my sister goes through an accident, and she has to go through a separate brain surgery. The good news is that my sister has returned back to work. My mother, when you meet her, you will never have ever guessed that she's gone through an accident like that. And the blessing is that the trier brain is the combination of three parts of your brain. It's the left side. Tria means three. Brain is your brain. Tria brain is a three-sided brain. It's the left side. It's the logical side, the, the problem-solving oriented side. It is the right side, the creative, expressive side. And it's the last side in which I am call, calling the faith sector. It's the part of your brain that connects the left side and the right side together. It's all the connections to the dendrites, it's the synapses that happen. And it's also the connection between your brain and your body. And not only that, it's the connection between your body and your outside world. You see, being in rocket science helped me create something completely new. The same mathematics that we used in rocket science, which was Einstein's theory and chaos theory, would be applied to neuroplasticity, which is neuro, meaning brain cells. Plasticity is being able to reshape. Neuroplasticity is your brain able to constantly reshape and what I call gravitational waves. Now, Einstein's theory, E equals mc squared, is the general theory of relativity. But in the Trier brain theory of relativity, in which I have uh, coined and developed, is your brain energy, BE, is equal to the mass that's constructed within your brain times the speed of light, which in your brain is how your brain fires, the speed of your light squared. Your Trier brain has energy in its connections. The left side is what we do to solve problems. The right side is the expressive part, and the faith sector is all the connections. And this is an illustration that kind of shows it. The illustration is that your brain isn't just here. Your brain is in your entire body. It extends through your entire body, through your nervous system. And I learned that through working with my mother and the neurologist and the neurosurgeons, working with my sister, getting her rehabilitation, and working with, and I, I, my two dear friends are here, Joel Crandall, who has the Voila Method. Uh, he, 
it's just amazing that I see that our thoughts are inside, not just our brain. It's, it's in our body. It's in our leg. It's even in a field around us. The role of a thought in your brain is very pivotal. A thought, any thought you have, its role is to convert energy in your brain. And this is a part of my tree brain theory of relativity. See, there's always chaotic situations that happen to you, that happen to me, that we all go through. And it's our job in the middle of that chaotic situation to choose a thought that will help reshape your brain from the inside out so you can actually become aware. See, you, by your thoughts, you have two types of situations. You can create a beneficial energy that allows your brain to reshape and unleash its power. Or you can create a toxic, unbeneficial energy where you will go around and around and around and around in loops, almost in obsessive, compulsive thoughts. And it will just seem just overwhelming. Uh, my uh, dear friend and the person that wrote uh, my foreword, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz, has identified and, and helped so many people with obsessive compulsive disorder with understanding how the brain works and how it goes in that cycle. The goal is for us all not to be in a cycle where our thoughts are just going around all the time without having some sort of unleashing benefit. Keeping your intentions in your awareness activates the faith part of your true brain and helps you shift the energy in all situations. Let me explain this a little bit more. Uh, rub your hands together for a second. Just rub it together for a little bit. Do a little bit more. You're like, what is this woman about to tell me to do? <laughs> All right. All right, now, after you finish rubbing it, okay, slowly take your hands away and like maybe just an inch or two away from each other. What do you feel? Do you feel it pulsing? You feel energy. Some people, when they look between their hands, they kind of see something. Some people can't. Some people can. Do you feel that? What if I told you that's your brain energy passing through you? Do you feel how powerful that is? Do you know how to use it? What I recognize in part of my theory of relativity is that we conduct energy. Our brain conducts energy. Our thoughts convert energy. And this comes from Einstein's theory of relativity. And when we have thoughts, it's not just in our head, but actually it forms in a field around us. Through this illustration here, it's in my book also. Thoughts convert energy into and out of your brain in a field around you. Now, in 2016, one of the most amazing things happened, and this is an illustration, uh, it's fictitious. Uh, this is a fictitious illustration of two black holes colliding in space, which really did happen. In 2016, the LIGO, uh, uh, the LIGO scientific organization found that two black holes actually collided in space. And now, this was something that was huge because this was only a theory in 1916. Albert Einstein, a part of his theory, general theory of relativity, was able to show mathematically that when there's gravity, it's not always in a straight force, and it's always not always straight. It can actually travel in waves. And people thought, oh, back in 1916, they were thinking, how can this man think that Gravity travels in a wave. What is he thinking? 
but he based his theory of relativity on this fact. Guess what? A hundred years later, it was proven. Two black holes actually collided in space, and when they collided, they caused gravitational waves. Now, let me explain what gravitational waves are. Gravitational waves are waves that pierce through all time and space. It's so powerful that our entire universe functions from it. Now, we're going to see and understand a little bit about brain brink, which I'm going to share with us in a little bit. But when you have toxic thoughts, that actually creates something in your brain. And that something is not so great, and we're going to see that in a few minutes. But just like two black holes collides in space, and it causes massive, massive gravitational wave that cuts through all time and space and goes to all the different planets, you do the same thing. You do that in your brain. You see, there's collisions that happen in your brain all the time. Your brain molecules are colliding. You, in fact, are creating your own gravitational waves. And that's what I created and understood, is that identical to gravitational waves, the tree of brain waves, this is the waves when our brain is fully connected with all those sides, the left side, the right side, and the faith side, those gravitational waves literally come out of you, and they pierce through all time and matter, just like Einstein's theory about gravitational waves in 1916, but this is now updated to 2017, 2018, to apply it to a new branch of how your brain science works. And that's the blessing I'm so thankful for to have gone through this rocket science is this is now how I have the opportunity to apply it to help millions of people. So you actually have waves around you. Now, let's think about this example so I could really bring this home. Have you ever thought about, um, let's say as a child, have you ever been in a situation where a child is bullied? Have you ever seen that or experienced that? What if I told you that there's two things going on? The thought of the child who is bullied his thoughts are not only here, but they're around him, and people can pick up on it. That is an example of your tree of brain waves. And the other side of the coin is there's individuals who are purposely looking for people to bully. And they have an energy around them with their thoughts. Chaos. Chaos. What comes to your mind when I say chaos? What comes to your mind? Chaos. Something you can't control. Like what, what, what? Ah! Ah! Chaos! Ah! Oh yeah, that's what it really is. Uh, Sometimes your brain can shut down when you go through chaos. In the book, I open up the first chapter with bang! A real car accident scene of where my younger sister was in a car accident. She's well and okay. But sometimes we go through things that we can't explain. It. It's so literally chaotic that we don't know why it's even happening. And that's the key thing. And maybe that's not the right question to ask. Chaos, it comes in many forms. This is a hurricane. Uh, uh, NASA satellites capture hurricanes all over, and this is one of the biggest hurricanes seen. That's the eye of a hurricane. And that's miles and miles and miles deep down. Chaos. There's Mathematically, a way we represent chaos, and some of you know what this is. 
Raise your hand if you know what this is. All right. This was the 1994 earthquake. Wendy Yost, our uh, announcer, she and I were in the same building during the 1994 earthquake, January 17th, 4.31 in the morning. Our building started collapsing on us. We escaped with our lives. And when we, just to give you a little background of what this was, this was chaotic, literally. Uh, my sisters and I were at, in my dorm room. That was the one weekend they decided to visit their older sister. And uh, we were in the building when it was shaking. Everything was thrown to the middle of the floor. The, the pictures were thrown as if someone was throwing frisbees across the wall. The refrigerator was picked up and dropped and completely thrown into the living room. The, the windows shattered and broke. The TV flew across and fell in the same place that my sister's head would have been had she not been sleeping in the bed next to me. We were able to get out. But upon getting out, there was an aftershock. And the aftershock started separating the stairs from the wall. And I looked back, and I saw this. This is how creepy it was. There was the bolt on the wall, and it started separating, and it started going down, and we started going down the stairs with it. And I threw my sister on my back and my other sister, and we jumped down one story, well, not, it was a little bit less than one story, and we got out okay, and then we went to the emergency exit, and my intuition told me, don't go. And I was like, why? Then I looked up, we saw sheets of falling glass. Had we gone out the emergency door exit, we would have died. Sometimes things happen, and we don't understand why. But we survived, and uh, we, when we got outside, we saw walls of flames. And never had we been so thankful for the purpose of our life at that moment in time that we still had it. Chaos math explains unpredictable events and represents the identical patterns seen in multiple locations of the universe. Now, we use chaos theory. It's actually real mathematics. And we use it to actually go to Mars. Did you know that? Chaos mathematics represents, math, mathematically it represents situations that appear so chaotic, you can't explain it, but really there's some inside pattern that we don't know about. Uh, I remember having JPL come to one of my classes at the, at the college I teach, and they explained that the way that they found the pathway to Mars is that they looked inside of an oyster. You see, mathematically, chaos could represent how a sand particle would go in and out and swirl around inside of an oyster cell to create a pearl. And when they identified that and looked at that identical pattern, they applied that to space. There's freeways in space. If you're on one track, you may stall, and it won't give you enough uh, you won't have enough fuel to get to a distant planet, but there's another place just a couple of inches away that you get in that spot and it throws you to the planet. And that's an application of chaos theory seen in this illustration of how we get to Mars. Do you see a pattern here in this picture? This right here is the roots of a tree. What chaos does is it mimics patterns in one area of the universe and shows it in another place. Do you know what that is on the right? That's a, picture, a satellite picture of a river in Russia. You see how the, the roots of the tree are very similar to the roots of the river? That's chaos mathematics. Now, how, what do you think that is? Now, here's the same river. What do you think that is? That's how uh, physical mass forms in our brains. Do you see that branch-like structure? Do you see how similar it is? That's chaos theory mathematics at work. Just like a tree 
that has deep roots, and the stronger the root, the, the, the stronger the tree, your brain is the exact same way. The stronger your nervous system roots are, the stronger that you're able to feel situations, digest it, be aware of it, be cognizant of what's going on in your life, and process what is happening effectively creates a stronger brain. Your brain literally, in my theory of relativity, in my tree of brain theory of relativity, when you have a strong nervous system connection, you create a stronger brain. Now, chaos, there's such thing as a fractal. You see, you can start off in one place, but end up in two different places, depending on the road. Like, for example, if you have two identical twins, and they're born in the same place, same time, but one ends up healthy, and the other one, down the line, 20 years later, has terminal cancer. They've been side by side for years. They've even ate the same food. What makes the two different? Chaos mathematics represents when you can start in the same place, but you can have a success state where you are someplace where you want, or you're in a stalled state, a place where you don't want and you cannot grow. And then there's that fractal, which is on the boundary of what you do want and what you don't. In this theory of relativity, there's a fractal moment, and it's called a decision. When a chaotic event happens in your life, it doesn't make any sense for you to ask why. I want to really break this down for you so you really understand this. When a chaotic event happens in your life, don't ask why. Ask, how am I seeing this situation, and how can I make it beneficial to where I want to go? When you have an intention in your life, when you set your mind out to do something great, you have to hold on to that no matter what you encounter. That intention is going to allow you to get to a success outcome, and holding on to that intention is what creates a fractal moment in time. Your fractal moment is your decision in your thoughts when a chaotic event happens in your life. You, you see, you have a choice. It's called free will. For myself, I went through rape. I went through violence, poverty. I had to have an intention in my life. I had to see myself successful. If I didn't have that, all the things that I encountered wasn't going to allow me to be the change in which I wish to see in the world. You see, you have that choice, too. Whenever chaotic situations happen in your life, you must know how to view it, and you must know how to use all the energy that it brings you to get you to success. Uh, Albert Einstein. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift. And the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. That was uh, posted in one of the Voila Method uh, posts, and that was so inspirational, and it allowed me to be able to see something deep. Intuition. See, sometimes when chaotic situations happen, and you don't have the evidence in front of you to know that you're going to be successful, and you don't have any tangible evidence to know that you're going to be able to get through something, your intuition is something that helps you in that moment of time. Now, I happen to be a spiritual person, and I happen to believe in God. 
And I truly believe that your intuition is a gift from God. And we have each been given this gift for us to move on a path that is going to be successful in our lives. But we have to know how to use our brain in order to do it. And I truly believe that our, in, our intention coupled with our intuition allows us to move forward in uh, where we're planning to go. And just like we have uh, in north and south part of our Earth, the North Pole and the South Pole, we have the North and South part of our brain. What, in my theory, we have a magnetic field that actually operates with our brain. And that magnetic field helps us use intuition. Now, intuition is not something that is like hokey pokey, woo, but it's something that we all naturally can use. Sometimes, yeah, for example, have you ever thought about someone and they called you? Well, that's your intuition working. You are actually sending out a message, a wave, that's piercing through all matter and time, giving a person knowledge to pick up the phone and call you. Have you ever kind of saw a situation and you thought, ooh, I know where this is going and I'm not going to be a part of it? Has that ever happened to you? Well, your intuition is working. It's showing you the signs and the patterns to show you the future before it exists. See, that's the third part of our brain, the faith sector. It allows us to be able to see situations independent of time and space. It's the natural part of how our brain works, but we're not used to thinking about neuroscience like that. We're not used to thinking about the brain like that. We're not used to knowing that we actually have intuition that helps guide us in the middle of chaos. It's one of our biggest gifts. It's what keeps us safe. It's what allows us to think twice before we exit out of an emergency exit and it gives us the sign to look up, to see glass falling. We each have that. Brain brink. Uh, brain brink is when you experience a chaotic situation and you don't know how to emotionally process it. Uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf, a, a neuroscientist, was able to determine that when we have toxic emotions, fear, anger, anxiety, it actually creates dark, tar-like masses in our brain that creates, it's like its own dark magnetic field that keeps our brain from actually reshaping. And uh, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz and, and, and Dr. Caroline Leaf speak about this highly. And CTH, uh, chronic traumatic enthropy that has been seen in Football players with concussions. This is like the first evidence that this dark, tar-like matter actually damages the brain. Do you see this right here? These are actually two real-life cross-sections of brains that were damaged with CTE. And you see that dark part here? It looks like a burnt cookie. That's how I look at it. It sounds strange. But this dark part, that's like the dark, tar-like mass. And when we go through difficult, chaotic situations, and we don't know how to process it, what happens in our brain is there's over 1,400 chemical reactions that happen. Our adrenaline increases, our cortisol increases, our heart rate increases, uh, uh, there's temperature rises. We create a chemical environment in our brain that creates a glue, I call it a glue, for lack of a better word, that literally sticks our brain together so it keeps it from reshaping. And if we don't get that glue out, if we don't find a way to change our thoughts to remove it, you end up with this. Now, this is physical trauma happening, creating this, concussions. But emotional trauma is just as bad. Chaos also happens in mirror images. Sometimes, you will find situations and you'll mirror people. 
how chaos works in all of our lives is that when we go through chaotic situations, you will mirror the people in your life. You will mirror somebody that will come to you that will have an answer that you're looking for to get out of a chaotic situation, and you'll attract someone who's going through it that can't get out of it. That's how chaos works in our lives. The lesson is chaos doesn't happen to you. Rather, chaos happens to help you walk in your life purpose. I had no idea that being a rocket scientist was actually going to lead me to neuroscience. No clue. Now, I'm not, just to let you know, I'm not a classically trained neuroscientist. I do not have a degree in neuroscience or, or psychology, but rather I am a scientist who applies physics and mathematics to how the brain reshapes. Whenever you go through things in life, it always happens for a purpose, and although it may seem chaotic, there's a reason to help you move forward. Your job is to see the situation and change your thoughts around it, both with your own help and with help of professionals around you to help you see things in new ways so you can reshape your brain to get that brain brink out. Brain exercises. All right. Now, we're here. We've just found out all about this part of the brain. What can we do? What on earth can we do in order to actually reshape our brain? Well, I have a couple of tips for us. Are you ready for these? All right. Um, Dr. Andrew Newberg, he was able to find out that prayer actually changes the brain. Did you know that? Prayer it actually activates the frontal brain lobes. And this is the same type of executive thinking, a part of our brain that allows us to find solutions and answers. And it's actually one of the best parts of the brain that calculates and finds solutions in math, science, engineering, and technology. Did you know that? Uh, literally praying. And it's not, it's, I'm realizing myself, praying isn't, everyone has different views and however you look at it, but praying is recognizing that you are a part of a larger system and you have no idea how you will contribute to this larger system, but it's requesting the ability to be a part of a beneficial system that will help you and many other people. It's for healing, it's for, for grace, it's for patience, it's for bettering your life and the lives of people around you. Uh, select relationships in your life that mirror where you want to go and not where you've been. Do I need to say that one again? Yes. <laughs> you must select people in your life. Select, and that's a choice. The decision-making process in your brain literally reshapes your brain. You must select people in your life where you see characteristics of where you want to go in the future. By doing that, you are creating the chaos to work in your favor. You are, in turn, creating a future for yourself with you not knowing the specifics of it, but the intention is, I will have these qualities that I find beneficial. And in turn, you will create relationships and people will be attracted to you because you have qualities that they also admire. Chaos brings a mirror relationship to you. Mathematics and science. You know, researchers have found that when you use mathematics, science, technology, engineering, that you actually are reconnecting your brain. When you do simple math, for example, simple math every day, do a calculation, do multiplication, do one of these exercises, we see them all the time. When we do a basic math calculation every single day, we connect neurons of the left side and the right side in and inside our entire system, so our entire system becomes stronger. Accept that intuition is a gift. Allow its holy energy to, to, 
to guide you before any physical evidence exists. This, my friends, is the meaning of faith. You will go through so many different situations in your life. And I'm honored to be here with you right now. Because as you go through situations, I want you to always remember this. You have a purpose for your life. Your thoughts are more powerful than you know. You not only can reshape your brain by your thoughts and your own awareness, but you can reshape your entire life by how you see yourself in your world. You can take any situation that has happened in the past and you can really shift it in your brain so it can work for you and no longer against you. You have the ability to change this world. And it's no accident I'm here speaking with you. I truly believe that every person in which I speak to will change this world and do great things. If I could become a rocket scientist, You can do anything that you want to do. You can always find me on AnswersUnleashed.com. You'll find all the great experts on there also helping you find different ways to reshape your brain and see the world differently so you can take leadership in your life. You can always find me on Facebook and social media under the links here. And it has been my honor to speak with you today. All right. Here comes the fun part. We have question and answer. Now, I know this is a microphone coming around to some of you, and I will find out where you are. Uh, so this is your time for question and answer to ask questions. Do we have time for that? We do? OK. Uh, so uh, if we have an opportunity to question and answer, if you have any question about anything that was uh, said today, if you have anything that you'd like to have answered in your own life, uh, feel free to bring it, and let's just see what we can do. Yeah. Now, who has the microphone? And wave your hand. Okay, great. And so, uh, if you can say your name, yeah, whoever is going to ask a question, if you can say your name and uh, your question. Pierre Harbin, a student at Pierce College. Uh, yes. Uh, Professor Olympia LaPointe. Oh, thank you. And my question is, is thought matter? And if so, does it have weight? Thought. Ooh, that's a great question. Is thought matter and does it have weight? Uh, do you know what? That's actually something in which we're still figuring out. Uh, neuroscience is groundbreaking at this point in time. We are learning more and more about the brain every single day. And to answer that question, I have no idea. We will be finding that out, mark my words, we'll be finding that out probably in the next five and 10 years, identifying how thoughts actually reshape the brain. Um, specifically with the true brain theory of relativity where brain energy is equal to the mass times your brain fry or light speed squared. With that application of the true brain theory of relativity, energy, and thought and mass 
actually would go hand in hand. So with this theory, your thoughts actually do create eventually a mass structure in your system. But this has to be proven. And sometimes it takes a while. So we'll be finding that out. Thank you for your question. Please give him a round of applause for his question. <laughs> Next question. Who has the microphone? And wave your, wave your hand so I can see. I have my glasses on. I'm trying to look cute for you right now. <laughs> oh, hello. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, okay. You're, in a, you're right in front uh, thank, of me. Thank you for the wonderful, wonderful lecture. I, I thought it was fantastic. And um, I do have a question. I'm in total agreement. Um, how would you address someone who would say that the brain is subject to classical mechanics, that it's a large structure, and that given that it's a classical instrument, it's going to be um, deterministic, that, it, that there's, no, there's no way that we can have free will, volition, agency, etc., because, you know, from... The Big Bang or, or before, uh, everything's in motion and it will remain in motion. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, the, I'm going to answer it the way that I can answer it. Uh, it's not going to be with technical jargon, but rather just genuine. We have free will. And I'm a true believer that our choices can reshape our brain and that our brain can rewire itself with awareness and with mindfulness and with the ability to see the big picture and figure out where we fall in it and make a decision regarding that. Uh, never ever do I believe that we are stuck with whatever has just happened or whatever has happened in our brain. There's no reversible way forward. And I speak about that from my own personal experience with my own mother. I can't speak about anyone else exception to what I've witnessed for myself. And what I have witnessed is that my mother's brain literally grew back. Now, it's not the same. Things sometimes that happen are not the same, but sometimes it rewires in a way in which we would never expect. And I can speak from authority from what I have seen personally, is that the brain can grow back. Thank you for your question. Please give him a round of applause. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a question. Uh, wave your hand. Hi. Way up here. Oh, um, nice. Thank you so much. I really enjoy all your videos and the work that you do. My question for you is because I'm in transition, I feel that a lot, a lot of times we get attached to our identity, um, who we are, who we think we are, usually attached to either our title or being a mom or whatever that is. So sometimes we may find it hard to transition into something else, kind of letting that die off and something be reborn. Um, and for me, I love the work that you do with the brain because I, I really believe you know, everything's up here. How do you feel about someone that may be attached to that identity and when they do try to think different or you know, act different or any, something's fighting them inside of them? Mm -hmm. Is that neurological, you think, and it's just the reshaping? How would you deal with that? Great question. Just absolutely a, a magnificent question. Uh, I, I dealt with that myself. You're not alone. And there's millions of people that deal with that same type of situation where uh, they are categorized in one way, and that's all they know. And then when they try and break out and do something completely different, it will literally, ah! Uh, cause so much anxiety in them that they can't even function at times and they shut down. And that's happened to me too. So you're not alone. And many people that's gone through that. And when I've seen that happen, when I've seen and helped other people, and when I've actually gone through it myself in my own therapy, uh, there's two things that happen. Sometimes we go through, let me put it this way. Sometimes when we are attached to a particular identity, it's for safety reasons. It's sometimes the thought of us doing something different or the thought of us seeing ourselves being in a completely new life will cause so much anxiety within us. It's both physical and it's mental within thoughts. And it deals with a past trauma, typically, and not all the time, so it typically deals with a past trauma and a belief system that's circulated around that particular trauma. And that belief 
from far back has to literally be re-changed and shifted to be a new form right now. Like, for example, perfect, like if I share my own experience, I'm so used to being a rocket scientist. Ask me to calculate ISP, which is like the horsepower of an engine, I can do that in a second. I can tell you the conductivity of, of different metals. I can tell you the different concoctions of metal and tell you whether or not it's going to have bending moments and explode versus stay stable. But if I apply that information, same powerful information to how the brain reshapes, and I'm not used to doing that, I have one of two situations. I could completely either go into a mode of, ah, I'm not quite sure of what I'm doing, or I can choose to go through it and receive cognitive help to be able to process my thoughts so I can deliver it in a way that makes sense. I'm a firm believer in cognitive therapy. This is when there's trained professional individuals that will come alongside of you and help you identify the thoughts that limit your particular reality. And once you become aware of what those thoughts are, and you learn, I'm no longer going to accept that thought, and I'm going to think something new. That's when there's no longer a fight within your own body structure, and there's no longer a confusion when you understand and are aware of where and how your identity has been formed. If your identity comes from your parents, and you're trying to uh, appease your parents, and not appease yourself, that's going to cause a conflict. If your identity is always trying to help someone else like a child, and it's not helping yourself, that's going to cause a conflict. Our role as humans is to figure out why we think the way we do, and see if those thoughts are still valid. And I've learned this through both uh, Dr. Jeffrey Swartz and uh, Joel Crandall, and I thank you very much for that. Thank you. Great. All right. All right. Do we have another? Do we have time for another question? Well, one more? Two more? Two more. Two more questions. Okay. Where's the microphone? Because remember, I don't have my glasses on. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Um, Danette Singleton. Um, I actually know your friend, Randy Shepard. Um, I know your friend Randy Shepard. He told me about this event, so I looked it up and I had to be here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for being here. You're welcome. Um, you mentioned that Dr. Andrew Newberg mentioned um, that ch prayer can change how the brain works. Mm -hmm. Are you able to elaborate on that a little bit? I've had instances where I've prayed over and over about something and like, it didn't happen right away, but eventually it did shift. It was, like, out of, like, distance away, but it did shift, and I didn't know how it worked. I just knew it worked. Mm -hmm. Are you able to elaborate on that, um, any? Sure. Um, I, again, I can elaborate on my own personal experience. Um, uh, the uh, research scientist was great. He has created a completely uh, book designed to help understand how the spiritual aspects of a person's awareness uh, affect his or her cognitive ability. And he did brain scans to determine what area of the brain was actually firing when someone would no longer be thinking, but actually be meditating. And meditating, and prayer is a type of meditation where you are uh, allowing to work with the universal system of of how the universe works. And for my particular background, I, again, I believe in God. And uh, my personal experience is that uh, when my mother was in her particular accident, uh, she went into brain surgery and uh, she was in there for 11 hours straight. And we didn't know if she was gonna survive. And uh, there was people from my uh, prayer team and prayer group from my church that came to the hospital to support us because as you, can, as you can imagine, having a mother go through something like that and then having to handle that cognitively was overwhelming. So they came to be an emotional support during that time. And I remember what they prayed. Uh, we were all in a circle 
And uh, Lisa was her name. She prayed that uh, my mother would survive the surgery and that the bleeding would stop. And uh, we prayed this. And when the surgeon came out and told us that she survived the surgery and the bleeding stopped, for me personally, I wondered, what else wonderful can happen? And uh, that was the first time that I recognized the power of faith. I was trained as a scientist, but that was the first time I saw the power of faith and how we can believe in a, in a positive future and move towards it no matter what. And I saw that same aspect with even when I went back to work and was working with a scientist, and I saw their passion to work towards building a two, three-story tall engine for, off of a dream they had at nighttime, and they were working off of faith, it was no different. It was that ability to recognize that there was a higher power that we all belong to. And the faith and the prayer in my own life helped our mother and helped me as well. So thank you so much for your question. Please give her a round of applause. All right. Oh, okay. This is one of my students here. Oh, stand up. Stand up so people can hear you. This is one of my students. Please give her a round of applause for coming over here. Thank you. Beginning, you oh, right here. Thank you. <laughs> in the beginning, you were talking about how um, you went through all this tragic with all this tragic stuff, and I was able to identify with one of them with you. And um, my thought is, my question is, what was the process of you transferring this energy? You know, of being raped at mm -hmm. such a young age. How did you transfer? Because I could just imagine how broken it is, how lonely you felt, how unwanted, and all this area of things. How did you transfer that to what you are now? Okay. To what, like, you know, like, how successful, how mm -hmm. sure of yourself are, and how confident you are in yourself? Well, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Um, I actually learned, the benefit about that is I actually learned to speak up. I actually learned to speak up. Uh, and I was, just thinking about this the other day. Uh, that happened when I was eight, and then the first time I was ever on stage is when I was nine. And before, I was really, really shy. And uh, I, I erased that event from my consciousness for years until I could remember it and I could process it and work it out with professionals. Uh, but it was amazing because subconsciously, I knew I had to speak up. And when I was nine years old, I channeled that energy, not knowing it, into being on stage. And that was when I was in my first play. And that's when my mother came over to watch me in my first play. And I remember here I was speaking up, and I saw my mother over there. So my, she was always in the back, too. So I thought to myself, I'm going to speak up so she can hear me. And I learned that whatever it is that I wish I would have done, or wish, and, and when you're eight, you can't do much. And, or when we go through certain situations where we're really young, we don't have that. But when we identify that we have power in situations, that our choices actually give us options in life, when we recognize that we have a choice and that we can define the life that we want, that's what allows us to take back our power. And for me, I worked with great people to help me realize that every voice is important. Every voice. So thank you for your question. Thank you.
All right. Thank you so much. Can we get another round of applause, please, for Olympia? So on behalf of Cal State Northridge and the Alumni Association, we want to thank you for your time today and for sharing your talent and expertise. And we actually have a second video that we're going to show, a real quick five-minute video, before we have you join us in the lobby for a book signing and continued reception. So we're going to let Olympia depart. And... Uh,